I'll get started. Um, hi everyone, welcome to the session. My name is Sam King. I'm the Special Projects Engineer from International Coastal Management. We're a micro multinational coastal engineering consultancy based on the Gold Coast with a track record in eco-engineering principles and pioneering new ideas to improve coastal and marine environments in Australia and around the world. Uh, unfortunately, Bobby Corbett wasn't able to make it to the uh, symposium this week, so I'll be presenting today. This is the first of five integrated, complementary, and cooperative academic and industry talks on leveraging the science to position the Great Barrier Reef restoration as the global benchmark. The other four talks as part of this series will be this afternoon from 4 p.m., starting with Robert Preston from Vital Places, who will be discussing catalyst infrastructure place-based visions for the Great Barrier Reef restoration. At 4.15, Professor Roger Tomlinson, who is the Foundation Director of the Griffith Centre for Coastal Management, will be discussing the academic role. At 4.30, Angus Jackson from ICM will be discussing implementation strategies to deliver solutions and manage impacts. And finally, tomorrow at 9.45 a.m., Paul Nieder of Raysworth Capital will outline collaborative funding processes and how easily we can use them to leverage existing funding and raise new funds at a scale. I implore each of you to also go to their talks this afternoon and tomorrow morning. Before I talk in more detail about the other four sessions, I'd first like to talk about what we mean when we say leveraging the science to position the Great Barrier Reef restoration as the global benchmark. Or, in other words, how we can best compile and make use of our existing and growing world-class knowledge base, collaborate, and in time develop and implement effective and innovative solutions, and finally, deliver good outcomes with net positive impacts that are great for the reef, great for the people, and great for the restoration projects around the world. To explain this further, we need to talk about the moon. Or more specifically, how in 1969, we managed to land people on it and then return them home safely. To achieve such an undertaking required a broad spectrum of specialist communities, such as who we have here today, and scientific, engineering, and medical fields. A massive, multidisciplinary collaboration of our best people and minds. Their work was then applied to a process, define the objective, compile the data, progressively test, monitor, learn, and upscale prototypes with agile adaptation until they did achieve their goal. The spin-offs, legacy and return on investment was widespread and beyond what was foreseeable at the start of the project. This led to the term Moonshot Project, an ambitious, exploratory and groundbreaking project undertaken without any near-term benefits but huge long-term returns. The V2 rocket on the left is about where we're at, but the Saturn V launch is where we really want to be. And coincidentally, the Apollo 11 launch was this day, 49 years ago. The Great Barrier Reef Restoration Project fits the definition of a moonshot project, where we have an opportunity to not only protect and restore the reef, but to develop new technologies and an innovation and research ethos that positions Queensland as a world leader in reef restoration, education and research. Although we aren't racing the circuits to the moon, we are in a race against time. So, leveraging the science to position the Great Barrier Reef restoration as the global benchmark can be divided into four aspects. The first is catalyst infrastructure. Catalyst infrastructure is a component of a smart infrastructure strategy that ensures that funding and investment into the Great Barrier Reef restoration delivers targeted outcomes and accelerates growth and business cases that are good for the reef, good for the people, and good for the industry. Robert Crestofino from Vital Places will be discussing this in greater detail, as well as some of the latest transferable learnings for the best ideas for place-based investment. The second aspect is the academic role, which is the creation of a knowledge hub for our own massive multidisciplinary collaboration 
compile and expand our understanding and knowledge of the Great Barrier Reef, encourage collaborative research, and to improve how we train science, engineering, and business graduates to communicate, work together, and establish future research pathways. To learn more about this, I encourage you to go to Professor Tomlinson's talk, where he will also discuss how this has been successful for coastal management knowledge and solutions on the Gold Coast. Thirdly, the implementation, which is the design, monitor, refine, and upscaling processes to achieve our desired protection and restoration goals. How we can utilize an industry friendly knowledge hub to progressively develop new solutions and technologies for reef restoration in a way that would reduce risk monitors and manages impacts, focuses on learning, and leads to world-class practical restoration outcomes, legacy, and spin-offs. <coughs> this will be discussed by Amos Jackson from International Coastal Management this afternoon. Finally, there is raising, uh, raising of collaborative capital, which is how the Great Barrier Reef Restoration can embrace, can embrace the benefits of new capital raising systems to raise new funds at a scale that will position the restoration the epicenter of marine collaborative investment. This will be discussed by Paul Niederer tomorrow morning in this room. The following are a few collaborative small and large scale examples and ideas of innovative res restoration and intervention projects that we've been involved in around the world. The first is a small scale project in the Maldives. In 2014, we worked with a group of marine biologists who were wanting to deploy a cluster of small artificial reefs for restoration. We provided the design advice to ensure stability and durability. And the result was the trial of a reef that otherwise likely may not have happened or may have failed sooner than preferred. Again in 2014, ICM developed and installed a multi-purpose reef off the beach from a resort in the United Arab Emirates. Parts of the coastline of the UAE are heavily engineered, which has had a significant impact on the coral reefs and marine habitat there. The reef was funded as a research and dive attraction for the resort, but also sought to provide habitat for the local fish species, particularly the now endangered Hamor, also known as the orange spotted grouper. Monitoring equipment was installed on the reef to provide data in real time on the water quality and the state of the reef and fish activity. And the reef was often dived as well. And with that data, we were able to monitor and understand the impacts of the reef on the site's environmental and coastal processes. And we were in a position to make agile assessments on whether it should be removed or remain at any time. Fortunately, there was no significant disturbance to the water quality or the water flow in the area, and the reef remained stable. Within six weeks, a mature endangered Hamor had discovered the reef and moved in. And over time, juvenile more have also been observed, as well as a small school of tallfin batfish to the delight of its divers, the reef divers, and the resort. Although only a small scale trial, the reef was evaluated to be a net positive impact to the area, restoring only some of the lost habitat. The knowledge gained from the trial, though, was then able to be fed back into further improve the design of the reefs for restoration, <coughs> to better understand and manage our impacts, and to help direct upscaling in a methodical manner. A significant amount of knowledge and control can be gained when good monitoring is in place, which can be used to develop progressively more effective solutions with wider and more positive impacts. Further, the reef demonstrated how good outcomes for habitats can be achieved when investment is from groups with values aligned with reef restoration. In 2010, ICM and EcoCoast Engineering <coughs> Spin-off from ICM teamed up with the diving and education charity Tawasul for the GEMS World Academy annual Week Without Walls program in Dubai. The program involved teaching 20 students about the field of coastal management and the significant role that marine ecosystems and reefs have in the United Arab Emirates and globally. The students were also taught about the basics of artificial reefs for habitat restoration and creation, with a design competition run to select a reef to be built. Three, two reefs were then installed off the coast of the Jamira Beach Hotel, with the students returning to the site often to carry out fish counts and surveys to monitor the performance of their creations. Programs such as these are good examples of how education can and should be incorporated into the Great Barrier Reef Restoration Project to engage with and inspire the next generation of specialists and to encourage interdisciplinary collaboration 
to solve real world problems in the bottom up. Another great example of how multidisciplinary collaboration and agile adaptation can bring about innovative solutions for global spin offs is the Naranek multi purpose reef on the Gold Coast. Naranek is an isthmus that separates the Narang River and the ocean, and the beach had a history of high erosion during storms. Under growing pressure to prevent a breakthrough of the river and to protect the beach, and with no conventional options being affordable or appropriate, the unprecedented reef was constructed in 1999. Not only has the reef acted as an effective coastal protection asset, but it provided exportable knowledge and world-class experience in spin-offs. Additionally, the reef has provided great marine habitat attracting snorkelers and diving. And in fact, it has been scientifically assessed and verified to be a productive marine habitat. <coughs> the final example is a large-scale international collaboration to address the GBRRP, which in this case is on the Great Barrier Reef Restoration Project for the Great Big Rubbish Raft in the Pacific, also known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. 80,000 tons of plastic floating over an area of 1.6 million square kilometers in the Pacific Ocean, which is about four and a half times the size of the Great Barrier Reef. One solution being developed by the Ocean Cleanup Group to solve this monumental challenge involves the use of, to put it simply, a massive floating filter that passively gathers the debris which can then be collected. Initially failing to gain traction as a radical idea in 2013, as it was beyond the technical bounds of existing products, the project has rapidly progressed through continued prototyping, ocean trialing, field monitoring, research, and upscale testing. The project now has the knowledge base, technologies, and products commence cleanup this year. The cleanup of the Pacific Garbage Patch is a great example of how an agile and innovative research and engineering process rapidly turned what was once a radical, socially driven idea into effective technical solutions to challenges of a very large scale. The following is an, is an example of one such radical idea. Sediment runoff is a major threat to coral reefs. Could a purpose-built technology derived from silk curtains protect a reef at a very large scale? The challenge of investigating and addressing a radical idea such as this one is complex, multifaceted, and the pathway of delivering solutions can be unclear. But with a good process, we can navigate to outcomes successfully. New ideas come with big questions. How effective would such a curtain be? Would it be net beneficial to the reef? Can it even be built for how much and who would fund it? <coughs> what do we need to do to answer these questions? We need a process and a framework to leverage our existing world-class knowledge base, create a, multi, a, a massive multidisciplinary collaborative framework for delivering world-class and place-based outcomes that are good for the reef, good for the people, and good for the business case. Our impacts need to be weighed against the complete loss of the reef. And if you'd like to know in more detail about how we can do this, <coughs> I implore you and others about how we can leverage the science to, to go watch the other talks about how we can leverage the science to position the Great Barrier Reef restoration as the global benchmark. <laughs>